Today is just a quick practice day. I read something, saw something, watched a video, or whatever. You know what? You know how it is when you uh, spend your free time watching art instruction. I'm just roughly sketching out an oval, and I'm using Derwent ink tint pencils direct on the paper, no gesso. So you can follow along here. These are caricature, what I would call caricature faces. You know that there's eyes in the middle of your oval and you know that below that there's a nose and below that there's a mouth and then the chin. So, um, <laughs> as long as you don't put the mouth above the nose, you're going to be pretty well assured that you're going to have a face. In the caricature world or the cartoon face world, it really doesn't matter about proportions a whole lot. Your eyes can be oversized. You can have them spaced further apart. In real portrait drawing, you can pretty much bet that <clears throat> one eye width is there are going to be five of those across the face as you see it. In other words, from the edge of the face by the ear to the first eye is one eye, second eye is the that next eye, and then there's an eye width in the middle across the nose, then the other eye, and then another eye width toward the other ear. Now you can pretty well count on that if you're um, looking straight on into the camera. The eyes are placed just about halfway from the overall oval and the top of the oval being the top of the head hair can extend up beyond that I'm kind of drawing my cartoon eyes in here um, the iris of the eye extends under the eyelid sometimes it touches the bottom eyelid sometimes there's white under it and that is a personality individual trait in real life, eyes are rarely the same, but in portraiture, you kind of make them that way. Otherwise, it looks like there's something wrong with your drawing. Um, <clears throat> here we come with the nose, and I'm coming on down with that. Um, there's all kinds of measurements that are traditional, like um, from the eyes, you measure the remaining space in thirds the eye to the chin, divide that in thirds, the nose sits on one third and the mouth sits on the other. But again, we're doing cartoon characters so that doesn't matter. Um, the ears attach, that's where the cartilage hooks to the head, is pretty much always level with the iris. The um, the outside shape of the eye. The underside of the ear where it attaches to the face is usually at the bottom of the nose. Now again we're drawing caricatures so she's going to look like Dumbo with an ear that big but th that's okay too. You can paint it or leave it out. Starting in with a little bit of shading. Now Derwent ink Tense, that's I-N-K-T-E-N-S-E -E pencils operate like and, and work like watercolor pencils except this is ink ink tents in a pencil form so once these are activated with water and they're dry they do become permanent so always be light very light with your touch you can always darken it up. You can't go back in and lighten it unless you put gesso on it, which you can do. It's entirely legal. There are no rules in mixed media. That's one reason I love it so much. I like to use green where my face turns back toward the light. Logically, green and pink gray each other down a little bit cools the it cools it down a little bit so when you put green and red together hello you've got your portrait color or your face skin tone color which is a light pink and the light green so that helps the face turn back toward the ears so that it begins to develop the round 
three-dimensional look. That's what makes a two-dimensional drawing look like three dimensions. Now I'm going in with a water brush, and I remember when I did this, I don't know why the only brush I could find was a flat. Because I know Wiki has more. I'm going to go in now and liquefy a little bit. Look at that beautiful color. Derwents are very intense. <laughs> they are named correctly, ink tense. What I'm kind of trying to do with this is see, I'm more trained for realistic portraiture and glazing colors and oil. You can always adapt and modify what you've done. Pastels, you can do that too. So if you, you know, put a color on you're not real crazy about, you can always go back and particularly in oils, it's still going to be wet. So you can scrape it off with a palette knife or whatever. But with these, I'm really playing around with glazing to see what happens when I put different colors on top of dry layers. And this is just in my... Play journal. Now a little darker red. A little bit more of a cadmium red, which is an orangish red, doesn't have blue in it. A uh, An alizarin crimson red will have some blue in it. Now there it looks a little bit more like alizarin. We'll see when it gets wet. Bringing that right over on top of the green. Very, very light pressure. And remember, my experiment today is seeing how these colors might work for something that I'm trying to show on a journal page. So I like having a journal that I can just scribble in. If she ends up looking like an alien in here, it's okay. Actually, it's okay if she looks like an alien for real. A little different color of green. This green has a little bit of blue in it. The other one was more of an apple green. Sometimes I use a darker green on the shadow side and a lighter green on the light side. The eyebrows, the arch of the eyebrow really doesn't exist. It's the way the brow bone is curving away from us so it's curving away from the nose and that just gives the illusion of an arch that's why sometimes the overzealous pluckers look funny is because they've manufactured an arch that doesn't match the brow bone <clears throat> and that bone protrudes out from the eye socket and the reason being is that it protects the eyes so if you were to get smashed straight on in the face, your brow bone would take more of the hit than your eye socket. One way you can test that is to hold a pencil up to your brow bone. And it is above the brow bone and the cheekbone are out further than the eye socket bone. Does that make sense? And all that doesn't really matter if you um, give her man brows like I just did. Tiny little bit of blue or bluish purple 
I don't typically use purple. That looks like that's what that is. I don't typically use purples and blues in my skin tones because I think it makes them look dirty. That is something I reserve for men with uh, five o'clock shadow because blues make those whiskers look, make that skin look like it's got the day's growth of whiskers. But this is cartoon, so um, come on with the purples and uh, little splotches of colors that don't really appear in a face unless you're in a reflected light. Layering a few colors. This is a little bit of a yellow ochre. When I'm working in pastels, soft pastels, the way you get a skin tone is uh, yellow ochre. Um, and then glaze a little bit of cad red over that. And then um, your greens. And then a real, the lightest light yellow ochre, which is to the human eye looks like a real light warm white when you layer those and glaze them together they shine through each other and look like skin tone it's a very luminous look the upper lip is always in shadow and is darker than the lower lip. I say always. You know, it depends on where the light's coming from, but typically. And the little thing that goes from the nose down to the mouth, you just want to imply that. And what started out as fairly matched eyes ends up being off. One is smaller than the other. If you're doing that in a journal page, you can always just put hair over it. One of the hardest, the biggest challenges I have, which practice would take care of in my real paintings or in these art journals, is getting the eyes exactly straight across from each other and then the same size if you're looking at it face forward. I somehow always seem to get one of them canted just a little bit. When you're working with a water brush and a watercolor pencil, be sure to um, clean your brush off on a scrap piece of paper or paper towel because that pigment from the last color that you picked up will still be there. I've come back in with a an inexpensive pointed brush. I first thought it was going to be a decent brush because it was holding the point, but it wouldn't, um, if you shake it, it would not go back to its shape. So it stayed bent, and that made it practically worthless. It came in a kit, and uh, it's got Walter Foster's name on it. So pay attention to things like your brushes. The quality and the price does make a difference in the quality, which will enhance your uh, experience and you'll have better results. That doesn't mean you have to go out and buy a $300 Kalinsky Sable watercolor brush, but it does mean that the crap brushes in the kids aisle are not going to give you the same results. And so I've got the horizontal line between her eyeballs slanting up. 
which would be fine if her head was tilted, but the nose and mouth are not. So they all have to kind of go together. Another little quick tip, and I'll go in more detail some other time when I'm doing a real class. If you take a pencil and hold it perfectly horizontal to the eyes, say the outside eye, outside of one eye, across the pupil to the outside of the other eye, hold it straight horizontal. Now, hold it straight horizontal, come straight down. And the nose should be on that same horizontal plane, parallel to the two eyes. Drop your pencil down a little bit more, and your mouth under the upper lip will be exactly perpendicular, uh, excuse me, parallel to the nose and the eyes. The ears will be parallel. I guess that's all there is, the ears. As you can see here, my what is on my right side, that eye is slanting the horizontal line is slanting up. I'm glazing over the yellow now. Just playing to see what kind of color I can get. Can you just jump right in and use a flesh colored pencil? Of course. But if you can play with glazing thin layers of color and on the white paper, they will the individual layers will create a light effect which overall will look like flesh, but you can look at it and see through to the individual layers that you use to make that face skin tone. So you get a luminous look. All kinds of tricks and tools for measuring. You can measure with just the pencil or end of a ruler or whatever from the inner corner of the eye down to the nose and choose the same spot with the nose on either side and then measure from the inner corner of the other eye down to that nose. It should be the same. Mine is obviously not. I have no clue why I put a dark color on her cheekbone. I'm wondering the same thing right there, aren't I? Seeing if we can wipe it off. Okay, coming back in with some white. I wet the end of the pencil, just dunked it in my water. Sometimes that helps get a little bit more of the color off. And you can also apply these by wetting the paper and then drawing into the wet paper. So sometimes it's a combination of all of the above. So I could quit on her now and it's not offensive. Except for that eye. Toning down the pink a little bit with some yellow ochre.
that's a little bit of a purple, I believe, and it um, there is a cool spot where the brow bone goes in toward the eye socket and then comes out for the nose. So there is a cool a cool mark there, right about even with the eyes. Let's go back on this brush thing a little bit. When you're selecting a good watercolor brush, you want one that comes to a good point. And the more expensive brushes, sometimes those hairs are matched by hand. And they'll have longer hairs on the outside of the cluster of bristles and shorter hairs in the middle so that it will hold more water. But you can use the point for some very careful detail work. The Walter Froster brush that I'm using Oh, and then with a good brush, when you get it wet and you flick it and shake it, it should go back to a point and it should go back to its original shape. And this Walter Foster brush, this cheap one, has a good point, but it stays curved when you shake it. It's very annoying when you try to work with it. Of course, if that's all you've got, or like me, you're too lazy to get anything else. There's that darn blue again. I know what I was thinking. I was trying to use some unconventional colors. And have those colors stand alone more or less, like that purple over on her, her right cheek. It would be what we're looking at from the left. But that's what I'm trying to do. It's my story, and I'm sticking to it. The muzzle of the mouth is another round area. It pokes from the corner of the mouth up to the bottom of the nose. It curves out and then it curves back in. And the only way you can make that look three-dimensional is with the temperature of your color and with a few judicious shadows. You have to be careful that you don't make it look like dirt. And I used a cool tone there. I should. I should. That's not a word I use. Um, I could have used the green, which would have given us a little more realistic color than that bluish. And this is probably about the point, knowing me, that I'm looking at. Oh, I've only got 48 colors. They make more. But the quantity of color is not the issue, trust me. It's what you do with what you've got. And I teach what I most need to learn.
Looks like she's been in a barroom fight. Just playing with layering these colors to see what I get. Now we're coming in with the white gesso, and this is a trick I picked up from Jane Davenport. Put it in a uh, dauber bottle. That's what I love about mixed media. You can always cover stuff up. Softening the edges a little bit. Here's my cheap ass Walter Foster brush. Look at that thing, it just holds it. All right, go back in with the full strength. There you go. I'm painting with gesso. Imagine the light source and where it's coming from and where it would hit the high points of a face. that dang brush. A little bit drying. Seeing how these things react. I've had these Darwins for 10 years. I don't even think most of them have been sharpened twice. I'm trying to blend in that uh, gessoed spot a little bit. Go get a better brush. I wear myself out sometimes. Well, I quit filming, so we'll just go to the still shots. This one doesn't look anything like it did toward the end of the film, but that's the way it goes. This one's really pretty good. Um, I was experimenting, too, using matte medium instead of water. Here's a few swatches of the glazing. Uh, this page I was using Derwent watercolor pencils. This one I was getting bored. Wiki needs to learn how to quit when she starts getting bored. I was also experimenting with different undertones. This is the best of the day. It's really kind of cute, kind of moon face. And I wasn't doing anything but playing with pigments. This is just a grand experiment. I just want you guys to remember that practice makes perfect and 
every face I do is totally different. There is no consistency. Um, I think I, you can achieve a face tone with any medium you pick up. So have fun, practice, and here's facing you. Thank you.